preparation for me is the funnest part of the job because it's what allows me to sort of stay on my toes at all times. And for me, when I was fortunate enough to, to be promoted to the role uh, full time in 2020, the two questions I asked myself was how good do I want to be in this role? And then the other question is how much work am I willing to put in in order to be good in this role? In other words, I said to myself, I want to be the best reading clerk this state has ever seen, not to diminish any of the other contributions of reading clerks going back to when the state came into play, but I want to be the best at what I can be. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today we're glad to be joined by David Bowman, the Assembly Reading Clerk. David, how's it going? Thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, it's going well. Thanks for having me. Greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here. Yeah, as as many of our listeners might recognize, you are the voice of the Assembly, right? (laughs) The Reading Clerk. Uh, For you know, for people who don't know or or don't haven't seen you on the Cal Channel or, Mm -hmm. or on online. What does a reading clerk do? And, you know, how do you explain this to kind of like your average people on the street? Yeah. So, you know, the way to explain it, uh, if I'm walking down the street or in the halls of the Capitol Mm -hmm. and I get a staffer that comes up, hey, what do you do? Um, What I explain is that the most important role that I play during floor session is that I activate the members voting mechanism so that they can vote, which they will do roughly five to six thousand times per two year session. Um, In addition to that, uh, I read all the bill titles out loud, Mm -hmm. uh, proclamations from the governor, messages from the state Senate, uh, all while uh, navigating and operating a pretty complex voting system um, that, you know, during live televised, you know, floor sessions. So it gets pretty uh, intense for the most part. Um, What I will say also is that everything that I do, and, and I explain this to staff as well, everything I do during session that you hear me read is always at the direction of the presiding officer. So I never go rogue and just start reading what I want to read. Everything is done at the direction of the presiding officer, Uh, whether it's me rattling off, you know, 200 bills that the body is is, (laughs) ratifying that just came out of committee. Um, We're doing ceremonies. Everything you hear me say, again, is done at the direction of the presiding officer. And the last thing I'll say with respect to, to what I do in that role is that maybe 25% of it is actually reading. Uh, In fact, I've had staffers that didn't know that there were two displays, uh, screens that I'm operating during floor sessions Mm -hmm. as well that help me, uh, again, activate the members voting mechanisms. Um, There's a giant display board that's right behind uh, the speaker at the rostrum. I'm feeding information to that display board in real time during session so that members understand uh, what bills are being taken up, they understand what motions are being made in real time. So I'm feeding that board um, information. And then the other piece of it is understanding the legislative process so that, you know, we know what the vote requirement is to pass certain bills or to, you know, pass certain motions. Right. Um, so that's kind of a, you know, long winded short version of what, uh, you know, I actually do during session. It's not just standing up, putting on a suit and talking really, really deep so people can say in the hall, hey, you have a really, really nice <laughs> deep voice. It's it's actually <laughs> helping to run the operation uh, that is the uh, floor sessions in the state assembly. Right. So. Like, you know, there's that period like when you're reading those bills off mm-hmm. and, you know, you're, you're going so fast. Sure. Um, you know, it, and. I think they stop you at some point, right? Right. Sometimes right, they do. Right. Sometimes they just let you keep going, or what? Sometimes. So, so what you you're describing? Uh, so there are two instances where I'm reading. The, the first is when I'm reading the previous day's journal, right? Right. So theoretically, if the presiding officer, uh, if they wanted to buy time, let's say the assembly wanted to buy time, fifteen twenty minutes, right. They could have me read the entire previous day's journal. Right. That becomes problematic if the previous day's journal is three hundred pages. Right. So I read, and the moment I hear the presiding officer's voice. I know at that point they're making a uh, parliamentary maneuver to, Mm. you know, essentially cut that section of floor session. So the moment I hear Speaker Pro Tem Kevin Mullen or Assistant Speaker Pro Tem Chris Ward's voice, I know uh, to stop reading and to move on to the next phase of a floor session. Right. What's the longest you've had to read continuously? So the longest I've had to read was actually second reading, um, which is uh, when bills come out of committee. There were 369 bills on second reading, and this would have been July of 2021. So that takes about 369 bills, takes about 10 to 15 minutes to get through. So that's the longest 
I've read. The difficulty with that is you can't just stop and catch your breath or stop and right. get a drink of water. You have to keep going. So there are breathing techniques that you know I've learned to try and master over the years in this role. Uh, but that that that's the longest I've read, again, at one point in time without any interruption, without stopping. Thankfully, I had practice maybe 45 minutes before a session and didn't have any errors, thankfully. so. Wow. So you knew it was coming. You were prepared for it? They told you like, hey, we're going to have you read. Really yeah. Yeah. So generally speaking, uh, I will know how many bills are on the second reading file for that day. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of my preparation. I look at what bills are coming out, right. what bills are on second reading, third reading, um, and I prepare for those. Usually, I would say second reading uh, consists of anywhere from maybe 10 to, you know, 50, 60 bills. Um, that particular day, uh, the Appropriations Committee had had their suspense file right. hearing and reported out all these bills. And so, like I said, 369 bills later, um, you know, needless to say, Kevin Mullen was generous. Uh, Assembly member Kevin Mullen, when I got done, he gave me a small shout out. So that, that made the 10 to 15 <laughs> minutes, you know, of me reading uh, nonstop, right. it made it worth it. And so. you said how many bills per minute can you read? Uh, I mean, it, like I said, in that instance, 10 minutes, I can get through about 369 right. uh, bills. And, and you're literally just Assembly Bill 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right. 10. But there's another component to that that is difficult. If, let's say, of that 369 bills, 220 of those bills came out of committee with amendments, I have to then read the bill number with amendments. So it'll right. be Assembly Bill 10 with amendments, 20 with amendments, 30 with amendments, 40 with amendments, 50 with amendments, 60 with amendments, so on and so forth. So... You know, it's easy if you're just reading numbers straight. Right. It's the with amendments that sometimes will throw me off and make me have to sort of stop. And again, those breathing techniques that I've tried to, you know, implement. Yeah, that's amazing. It's like right. a like a singer, right? Right. Like, <laughs> right, right, right. That's crazy, man. <laughs> um, and so, like, you know, as you're you're kind of talking about, like, you know, you knew it was coming, right? You, sure. you, you saw how many bills were coming. So I guess you know how every day, you know, a floor session's coming. How do you prepare for that? So, you know, preparation for me um, is the funnest part of the job because, you know, it, it's it's what allows me to sort of stay on my toes at all times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and for me, when I was fortunate enough to uh, to be promoted to the role uh, full time in 2020, the two questions I asked myself was, how good do I want to be in this role? And then the other question is, you know, how much work am I willing to put in? in order to be to be good in this role. In other words, you know, I said to myself, I want to be the best reading clerk this state has ever seen, mm -hmm. you know, not to diminish any of the other contributions of reading clerks going back, you know, to when the state, uh, you know, came into play. But I want to be the best at what I can be. And so my preparation, um, you know, is literally going through every single talking point that's sent out the night before or days before I open my rule book and read the assembly rules every single week. Um, I'm constantly studying the Constitution, looking at uh, different provisions within the Constitution that governs what happens during the course of a floor session. Um, I'm, I'm up until two, three o'clock in the morning during the last weeks of session, looking at every single bill that's going to be eligible to be taken up that next day, because I'm looking at vote requirements on certain bills. Does mm -hmm. this bill have an urgency clause? Is this bill eligible to be taken up? Or is it bound by the 72 hour uh, provision, for instance? Um, I'm looking at uh, everything, um, like I said, and, you know, uh, watching film, watching uh, past sessions, watching sessions um, of this past, you know, two years is something I do more than anything. You know, it's analogous to you know, when you play sports, you watch film, right. not to just look at yourself. <laughs> right. I don't watch, you know, session DVDs or uh, floor sessions uh, in the past to look at me. I look at ways that I can be better. I look mm -hmm. at ways I look at my pace. I look at, you know, my enunciation, my pronunciation, my my cadence. I look at all these different things so that I'm, I'm, I'm a student of my craft, right? I don't ever want to get to the point where I'm unteachable even to myself. And so in order to remain in a place where I'm constantly wanting to get better, uh, like I said, it's, uh, you know, watching, I mean, hours and hours of, of session. In fact, when um, I first came into the role, um, I would literally come into work two hours early. I would stay two, three hours late and I would, you know, put a laptop next to where the reading clerk station is. And I would just put on old session DVDs. I'm talking 
1992, 1993, Willie Brown speaker, Jack right. O'Connell speaker, Tem, and I would play the sessions and I would just work the system on, you know, listening to sessions here. And that's literally how I learned the job. And like mm-hmm. I said, that's just something that has helped me, uh, you know, be ready. Because another point that I'd like to say is that um, you're constantly preparing for scenarios that may or may not happen. I have a friend of mine and he studies martial arts and he says, every time I train, I train as though I'm fighting six men all the time. And when he would say it initially, I didn't really you know, understand it. Yeah, until like, I would, yeah right. Right, right. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, okay. the likelihood of you fighting six right. men on your way home from work is, is probably slim to none. And then when I came into this role, I started to understand it more, right? I, I'm, when I am looking at talking points, for instance, I, I'm asking myself, if a member objects to this motion being made, what's the process? If another member objects to this member standing up and saying anything, uh, what's the process for right. that? Can this motion be tabled? Can this motion, is this motion debatable? Is this motion amendable? You're looking at all of these different scenarios to prepare for, again, what may not happen, but I don't, you know, for I don't want to be, uh, you know, in session and have a motion that hasn't been made in 80 years happen right. <laughs> all of a sudden today and not be prepared for it. And so I think, like I said, preparation with anything, um, again, is key. And, and it's no different in this role. Um, I, I, I greatly appreciate having the opportunity, but I also want to be able to do the job at the highest level I possibly can. Right. And that only happens because of preparation. So like I said, cracking your rule book open, your constitution. I would spend my Saturday nights uh, not partying and hanging out. I was reading my constitution, reading my rules. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it is, it, as much as it's helped me um, in this role, it's also helped me, you know, just sustain my career in the, mm-hmm. in the, in the Capitol. And so no, that's something. Yeah. So uh, you officially became the reading clerk in mm-hmm. 2020. I did. Yeah. So I was the backup reading clerk for about three and a half years. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2016, I was, I was promoted to that role. Katie Lewis, the former reading clerk before me, um, she had left the chief clerk's office in early 2020. And uh, right when COVID hit, uh, it, you know, we, Next. Wow. I mean, literally two months later. Yeah. So, so like as the backup reading clerk, how mm-hmm. much reading do you get? It just, it, it, it varies. Um, you get up there, you just don't get up as frequent. And that's difficult in the sense that uh, it's almost, you know, again, my sports analogy, right. like a backup quarterback. Right. Right. So you always have to stay ready because you don't know when that moment is that you're going to be called mm-hmm. upon to step up to the plate. The funny story is that I remember the first time um, I got up and read before the body. And all I did was read the role. Now I had practiced. And again, I'm putting in, you know, hours um, every day. I'm, I'm talking 20, 30 hours a week, just learning the system, mm-hmm. learning the rules, learning the procedures, learning. And not just that, it's also a point I didn't touch on was you, you watch film so that you learn uh, the presiding officers, their styles. Right. Uh, I watched a ton of film on Speaker Pro Tem Mullen when I uh, became uh, the backup reading clerk just to watch and see how he presided. You know, what's his pace? Where are moments where he may pause, uh, you know, or or go a bit faster, right, if we're moving through certain bills? Um, you know, you, you, you do that. And so the first time I get up to read, um, my hands are shaking violently and um, – you don't really know what to right. expect. And the moment they gavel in, everything goes blank. Mm. <laughs> and everything you've studied, much like it would be, you know, in college, everything you study for goes completely out of your mind. Mm. And you're just, you're there, the lights are on you, the members are watching. And it doesn't help the fact that at the time, uh, jokingly, the reading clerk said, it doesn't matter that millions of people could potentially be tuning into a floor session. No pressure at all. Just go out and do your best. And so I'm sitting there. I'm shaking. I'm nervous. Um, and, you know, Speaker Pro Tim Mullen, the clerk, will read. And I paused for maybe 10 seconds. Didn't say anything. It didn't dawn on me that <laughs> he had just told me, you know, directed right. me to read. And so um, I started reading. And, you know, obviously I'm nervous. And my brain's playing tricks on me. Did you say this? Did you not say this? Did you read this name? Did you not read this name? Uh, thankfully, I got through that day. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I was able to get up, you know, a bit more. But to go back to your question, you just 
you're up. You're just not up, you know, too often. So right. I'd say in a month, you may, the backup reading clerk may read, you know, twice, maybe three, you know, sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so you just have to, to, to stay ready because you don't, you know, when you're the backup quarterback, you know, you're, you're, you're cold. You got to go right. in and, you know, when you're the starter, you can go in, you're, you're, you're hot, you've established and, and developed you know a groove. On. You know the game plan. Right, yeah. right, right. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, you get up just not, not too often. Right. So who's your backup now? So right now that we, we currently have staff in our office uh, that, that are training uh, to become uh, the backup. My unofficial backup the last couple of years has been Russell Tomas. Russell's a good friend of mine. Russell served uh, in that role for a number of years. Mm. Uh, I, I I love Russell. Russell's a brother to me. But, you know, anyone that's watched session recently, um, Russell actually had a, a moment where lighthearted, funny moment. He accidentally uh, referred to. Assembly member Christina Garcia is Christina Aguilera. And so it was a, you know, I, I happened to be out that day um, and it was to, a total lighthearted moment. Right. You know, I mean, the members loved it. Assembly member Christina Garcia, you know, no one took it personal. Right. But it's, you know, when you're in that role, you know, sometimes you in the moment, you're thinking of something and you literally think out loud. Right. And that's the risk, <laughs> you know, you run. So I try not to watch too much TV. Uh-huh. I try not to listen to, you know, uh, music. I try and stay off social media before a floor session because you can easily plant something in your brain and you go out in floor session and you accidentally say it. Right. And, and it's recorded. You can't go back and delete it. Nope. No, nope, not at so, all. Yeah. That, that's funny. That kind of <laughs> gets me into my next question is, you know, I guess your membership, your, I guess your relationships with members, right? Sure. You guys are around each other a lot of, of times, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, hours and hours on end per mm-hmm. day sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. kind of what is it like, you know, day to day with these members, you know, for years, you know, some of them you've been around for yeah, 10 years. No. So. The members are great. Um, you know, one of the coolest parts of working in the state legislature is the relationship that you build with the members, you know, staff as well, but specifically members. Um, you know, my first year in the legislature, I spent more time at work than I did at home. Mm-hmm. My daughter at the time was one and I spent more time working. That was the year where we had three budgets and, and you know, it was an insane year. And so you built these relationships um, with members because of the sheer proximity in which you work together. I mean, right. you literally work side by side. And, I, you know, for me, um, I've always believed that when there is sort of a humanistic connection, um, that oftentimes propels the relationships that you have. And so, in other words, with the members that are here, members that have served, um, we, when we talk, it, it's rarely about politics. It's always right. about family. It's always about, you know, listening to their stories. It's 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 understanding their path uh, you know, as to how they got to where they are. Um, you build relationships. You have mentors. You, you, you have friends, you know, for for life. One thing that I do um, every the start of every session is I go through all 80 members biographies and I read them and I just try and learn as much as I can about mm-hmm. them. And so when opportunity presents itself to talk to uh, the members you're able to sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, if let's say a member played basketball and they decided to include that right. in their biography, why well, I played basketball? So we can, you know, sort of have that humanistic connection, that 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 sort of, you know, um, whether it's basketball, whether it's family, whether it's, you know, jogging, whether it's cooking. It, I mean, all these things sort of help build uh, these relationships. Some of my best friends, uh, one of my best friends, uh, former assembly member, Senator, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Jack O'Connell, um, him and I, we connected. It was during a state of the state address. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Governor Schwarzenegger was giving a state of the state address. And Jack O'Connell walked in. He sits down. He asks me if I have a piece of gum. And sure enough, I happen to have a piece of gum. We ended up chatting. He You're played, a gum guy. But <laughs> I am. <laughs> we ended up chatting. That, that two-second interaction, um, you know, really... You know, him and I are, if he lived in Sacramento, he doesn't. He's up here to Mm -hmm. lobby every now and again. Um, You know, we were almost inseparable. And so when Jack's, you know, up here, we'll have lunch and we'll have coffee and we talk. I'll check in on him. He'll check in on me. A great relationship based on a two-second interaction. Mm -hmm. And and that's really, uh, you know, what it is for, you know, all the members. Assembly member Ash Caldwell made me uh, TikTok famous, uh, which was great. My daughters, you know, loved it. In fact, I was in Chicory the other day. And uh, someone walked up randomly and just said, hey, I know you. I've seen you on TikTok before. 
<laughs> you know, sure enough, it right. was, you know, Assembly Member Ash Caller. And it was, you know, it's, it, I mean, you have these interactions. You talk to members. Um, and like I said, you 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 just learn about their stories, right. which for me is so incredible. I mean, the, you know, all 80 members have something in common in that they love the state of California. They want to see the state flourish and they want to see the people of the state do as well as they can. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may have different ideas as to how to achieve those goals, but they all love the state and they're good people. You know, they're really, really good people. Um, and so even like the last night of session this year, I, uh, you know, during some of the breaks that we had, I walked around to some of the retiring members of the members that have chosen not to run for reelection or what have you. And I just, you know, thanked them for their service and right. the, um, some of the things that, you know, members said, I mean, you know, we're in session, so I have to keep my emotions in check. But, you know, we're emotional. It's like you, like, wow, like I never, <laughs> you know, like David, you know, I have so much respect for you and what you do in the chief clerk's office and what you guys mean to the institution, what you mean to the process. You're having these conversations and you're like, wow, this is incredible, right? Mm-hmm. You know, this is just, th- this shows just how phenomenal this job really is, you know, and I, I try not to take it for granted at all. Um, every day that I go into uh, to work, every day I walk into a floor session, um, it's an opportunity. And, I, and I've said that in my private life, and I say that professionally as well. Everyone you meet, there's an opportunity. Um, and a, an interaction can change the trajectory of someone's day or someone's life. Uh, like I said, the members are no different. They're, they're, they're good people. They work hard. And uh, like I said, our relationship, you know, given what we do and in, in, in our role in the process just means that we have a closer seat, you know, to them. But building those relationships and having those relationships that extend beyond politics is something I cherish, you know, and I will cherish for the rest of my career. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, one thing you do is you, you always read the roll call, right? Sure. And, mm-hmm. you know, the bill will close. And then sometimes like, you know, members are, aren't on the floor right, or right. they like want to change their votes. Mm-hmm. How, how does that work? Do they just come up to the, the desk and say, that's, hey, <laughs> can I write this down? Is that no, an after yeah. session? No, that's a, that's a great, great question. So uh, to for a member to change their vote, um, every state doesn't allow for members to, to, to do vote changes. Mm-hmm. California is one of those states that does. And so it's a three-step process. Um, you know, if a member wants to change their vote, they so there's there are kiosks in the chamber. Right. So at the beginning of every session, a member is given, um, you know, a code, much like you would, you know, have a PIN code for your ATM card. No one knows that code but the member. And so if they want to change their vote, the first stage of that process is for them to use their code to go to one of the kiosks. They change it there. And then they have to announce it publicly before the body. Uh, members will jokingly say that's the walk of shame because they literally <laughs> have to come up to the dais right. and, and change the vote. Uh, and, and so that's the second part of the process. The third part of that process is that I, as the reading clerk, I have to repeat what the member, uh, you know, what their vote change is. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So it'll be an example would be, uh, let's say Assemblymember Cooper wants to change. He'll go up to the rostrum. Assemblymember Cooper, Assemblymember One, I to know. I'll then repeat it. Vote change. Assemblymember Cooper, Assemblymember One, I to know. Mm-hmm. Um, members, if they are just adding on, let's say they weren't on the floor right. and didn't cast a vote. Well, that wouldn't be a change. It's just an add-on. So in, in that case, they wouldn't have to announce it. Uh, they would just go to the kiosk and add their vote on. But again, it's only if you're changing it. And the last point is that you can only change a vote as long as it doesn't affect the outcome of that particular bill. So let's say that bill passed with 41 votes. Right. Well, you wouldn't be able to change your vote on that bill if it changes the outcome. You can't. Okay. You cannot. Right. You cannot. No. Yeah. And so when our minute clerk, Amy Leach, goes into uh, process that vote change, uh, her system will notify her this changes the outcome and, and we'd have to notify the members that that change, that vote change um, could not be processed because, That's yeah. Now that you say that you, you do hear that once in a while, the right. vote change, doesn't be like, no. man, when's the last time that happened? But oh, yeah. it happens a lot. It does. Yeah. And in the last few nights of session, you'll see it more, you'll see it happen more regularly uh, where members, I mean, you'll, and that process, uh, you know, 20 years ago uh, was completely different than what it is now. You'd see at the end of session, 40, 50 members lined up to do, you know, exactly what we're talking about, changing their votes. Now, 
Yeah, I mean, members, you know, will change. There's some cool stories behind members changing the votes. I won't get into uh, many of them today, but uh, um, if you ever talk to uh, uh, Senate Republican leader Scott Wilk, he shares his story all <laughs> the time right. uh, when he changed his vote one day. It, it, it's a funny story. I, I'd recommend. It may even be uh, uh, online. He talks about it all the time when he brings groups in to, to, to visit uh, the assembly, but. Yeah, so that's funny. Yeah, yeah, that's so funny. It's fun, good, you know. It's 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 um, and again, every state doesn't allow it. So you know, California's, you know, we'll say we allow things that you know other states, you know, tend right. To. Well, because sometimes, like you're, <laughs> as you said, you know, you're doing thousands of bills, and right. sometimes you, All the time, yeah. you know, yeah. forget right. which one, you know, the numbers, right? They can go quick, so, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, you know, we had the, we used to have like six year term limits right? Yeah. and you know, the members were just breathing, freezing mm-hmm. through. Mm-hmm. And then I, I remember, you know, when I started getting back into this again, you had a guy like Chuck Calderon coming back, right. who's, who's a veteran right. guy Love who, knew, Calderon, right. who knew the rules. <laughs> right, and I right. remember just watching him on the floor, like mm-hmm. he'd object all the time or right. Right? order point of orders yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we, I really haven't seen a member like Chuck. Yeah. Uh, who's really kind of absorbed the roles and kind of been uh, as participatory. Sure. Uh, and, you know, just talking to Ken Cooley uh, mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago, we're talking rules committee, right. kind of a guy, another guy who knows the rules. Of course, yeah. Really. Uh, kind of with these 12 year members mm-hmm. coming in now and they have kind of time to sit down and actually uh, absorb some of this stuff. Kind of sure. which members have you interacted with who come up and said, hey, yeah, I'm going to learn some of these rules and kind of kind of figure things out. That's a, you know, it's a good question. It's not so much that members will come up and, and, and say, you know, say it in, in that respect. I think to your point, uh, that's the hope, you know, when prop 28 came into play in 2012, I mean, that's the hope that it, 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 you know, allows for members to, you know, learn the rules and the procedures uh, in the house. If you go back to prop 140 in 1990, um, you know, one of the arguments behind the need for term limits during that time was that you had too many career politicians, right? right? And if you look historically, the average years of service for members during that time was about 14 to 16 years. Um, I mean, you had other, ex- you know, examples like John Vasconcelos and, and Willie Brown and Edward Vinson, Senator Collier right. that were here for, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, but generally speaking, 14 to 16 years was, was about the time frame that members were here. And what that meant was members had time to learn the rules. They had time to learn, as I mentioned, the procedures and learn really the ins and out of the institution. I think Prop 140, uh, among other things, it really took away the ability to be able to learn um, you know, the rules, so to speak, because you have six years, right? right. One of my best friends, Jack O'Connell, um, you know, Jack served 82 to 94 and 94 to 2002 in the Senate and then became superintendent of public instruction, great friend, incredible mentor. That's one of the things he would say when he was speaker pro tem in the assembly. He says, you know, you get these members that come in and the first two years they're trying to figure out where the bathroom is. Right. And then you got two years to try and make, you know, meaningful public policy. And then the last two years you're looking for what is next. If you look back at special elections in the decade before term limits, 1980, 1990, I think you had five special elections in the assembly during wow. that ten-year period. It's like we had five last year, right? <laughs> right, right. So if you look at you know 1990 to 2000, right. there's something like 40, 30 or 40 special. Ele- so you don't really have the luxury of learning, like I said, everything that goes on right. in the Capitol, learning the rules. And so Prop 28 comes, uh, and you know Prop 140, you know, legislature's budget was cut by 38 percent, 70 million dollars. I mean, so you lost a lot of the institutional memory. The staffers that have been here for a while that understood uh, the rules just as well as, you know, as the members right. did. And so, you know, 2012 prop 28 comes and, and, you know, like I said, it, 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 it the, the goal and the hope um, I'd say just from my perspective uh, in, in our office is, is that members will have, you know, that time to really get familiar and learn, you know, like I said, how this place works and, and you'll see members like, um, uh, you know, generally speaking, I'd say members are more, you know, leadership, let's say, you know, the Republican floor leaders. I mean, you'll, they, because they have a chance opportunity to learn this stuff. They're here right. longer, um, you know, but you'll see uh, certain sessions member, you'll see a member crack open his or her rule book and they'll come up and they'll have a question. And uh, no members I can think of off the top of my head, uh, just because like I said, during floor session, I'm, I see them, but, but I don't, 
And oftentimes when they're coming up and they're talking to my boss, I'm, I try to, you know, unless it's something that's pertaining to, you know, what's happening during right. the course of business in session, I try to, you know, give them privacy in terms of what they're talking about. So she'd probably be better equipped to answer that question mm-hmm. than, you know, than I would. But, yeah. uh, yeah. So like I said, you know, I, I, I do hope, um, like I said, the institution, um, you know, because that, that's to me what makes it, you know, it, it sort of adds a, a, a different element to a session. I was talking to the gentleman before we came on and you talk about the Willie Browns who just knew the rules right. <laughs> at the back of his hand. I mean, he was always 10 steps ahead of everyone else because he understood the rules, right? And if you understand the rules, you know, you understand, you know, how to sort of play the game of, right. of politics, right? I mean, it's, it's a chess game. It's, you know, and, and, and knowing um, really just puts you in a position to be, you know, set yourself aside, so to speak, right? From from folks. So. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you spend a lot of time mm-hmm. on the floor, mm-hmm. um, especially at the end of session. You're spending oh, yeah. hours with these people, oh, uh, yeah. especially uh, you know over the years. Mm-hmm. Kind of what what is the relationship between you know yourself and and the clerk's office with with the members themselves? Oh, great. Yeah, I mean it's it's you know, I would say for for you know we have staff that come in that you know. Um, I, I'm a people person, mm-hmm. right? So I love interacting and building relationships. One of the things that I say all the time is the beauty, excuse me, of working in this place is the relationships you build that last far beyond politics. Um, relationships that, you know, like I said, Jack O'Connell mm-hmm. being an example of that, uh, Jack and I would probably have never met. <laughs> you know, we come from two opposite worlds. Right. And, you know, we're different sides of the spectrum in many respects, but he's become one of my biggest supporters, one of my greatest mentors. And so the members that you have a chance to interact and you meet, for me, the approach I've always taken is just to try, um, you know, to, to not always make it about politics, right? I mean, that's the nature of what we do. Um, just, that's what's perfect about you, right? You're apolitical. You're, <laughs> right. Apolitical. You're the referee, I, right. Yeah. I just try to do the best I can, but members, I think, gravitate you know, toward as, you know, regular people do good energy, right? Yeah. Good energy. I'm not someone that, um, I respect the institution. I respect the members. I respect all the folks that work there. Um, but I never try and you know become someone I'm not, right. uh, when I interact with members, it's always genuine. Um, and like I said, you have those relationships, you know, I mean, you, you have a relationship with all the members. There's some members I mentioned, Jim Cooper, Jim, uh, was a friend of mine before he got elected. So I've known, you know, Coop for for a while. Robert Revis is also a great, great friend of mine. Brian Mainshine. I mean, the list goes on. These are people that, again, you sit and when you talk, it's never about politics. Right. It's always like, hey, how's your family doing? You know, how are your kids doing? Um, you know, uh, and occasionally you may have a conversation or two about, you know, politics. Uh, um, Assembly Member Patterson, also a great person to sit down and, 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 you know, talk to. And like I said, and, and I would say our office um, has always been great about, um, uh, you know, respecting the members, but also, you know, and, and everyone's experience is different. Uh, we have staffers that, you know, may just come to work and do their job and go home. That's right. fine too. Um, but again, I'm a people person. My, uh, my family always reminds me, like, Dave, any, no matter where we go, <laughs> people tend to gravitate towards you. And, you know, and I just, I, I don't know. I just try to be as, as open and, and uh, you know, and kind as, as, as I can. Yeah. And like I said, you have those relationships. There are members that still come. Um, former uh, member Isidori Hall is also a great friend of mine. He came in uh, when Assembly Member McKenna got uh, sworn in right. a few a few months oh, yeah. back. And he walks up and he gives, he gives the, the, I mean, the biggest hugs right. you'll ever have in your life. The Izzy hug. And, yeah. Right, right. You know, but it's, it's those relationships that, uh, like I said, are the reason – why in part I've stuck around for as long as I have, you know, because these are good people, right? Yeah. I mean, they're good people. They all have a, uh, you know, common interest to make the state of California better for the 40 million people that live here. Mm. Uh, but they're good people. You know, yeah. and you sit down and you, 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 you know, you listen at their backgrounds and, and, and some of their stories as to how they got to where they are, how they ended up in the assembly. They're members and like, I would have never in a million years imagined that, you know, I'd be here. And now that I'm here, I'm trying to do as good, you know, work as I can for the people, you know, in this state. And uh, our, our office, as I mentioned, uh, we always try and we pride ourselves on, on you know, integrity, uh, professionalism, um, and just knowing um, that, you know, and just 
making sure rather that information we disseminate or give out um, is 1000% correct, yeah. you know, because we do understand the impact that it has on, <laughs> like I said, the, the, the legislation that's moving through the course of the process. So, yeah. thanks. so like, you know, when, when you run floor sessions, like, you know, famous people come oh, yeah. all the time, yeah, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> who, are, who are some of the moments like famous people that have come through that you've got to meet as part of this? I would say, um, Jesse Jackson came my first, uh, I want to say my first year there, the president of Mexico came. Um, one of the coolest stories uh, that, that I'll share, and this is actually coming to me as we're sitting here, was the uh, Dalai Lama when he came. Yeah. So uh, when the Dalai Lama came, it was the first time in state's history that he'd been here. And so obviously it's a big deal. Um, and he comes in, and, and again, if you watch the tape, you know, you can confirm everything I'm about to say. He comes in, and you know the mood is just sort of different, right? Everyone's oh, Dalai Lama, let's right. you know. And he comes in. First thing he does when he walks down the aisle, um, he walks up to the camera and he just looks down and he's playing, you know, with the camera. So it sort of takes the air out of the room, almost like don't take yourself, you know, too right. serious. He then walks over as he's walking up to the uh, the dais, and um, the current chief clerk, Sue Parker. Uh, there are pictures and videos, like I said, he's touching, this is live, right? So he's touching her hair. He's, you know, not pulling it you know, hard, but he's touching it. And, you know, wow. I asked to say, is this, is this real? Wow. Right. right? So everyone's kind of looking like, uh, <laughs> is this actually happening, you know, during a live floor session? And so he goes up, he gives his remarks. He speaks for about 25, 30 minutes. And upon the conclusion of his remarks, he looks directly at me. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, he's not going to come over here. And if he does, you know, it, it'll be a lighthearted moment, shake his hand, and that's the end of right. it. Well, he comes over, he grabs my hand, and he asks, uh, where are you from? Where are your ancestors from? Well, he didn't say ancestors. He says, where are you from? Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I'm like, well, I'm from, you know, Sacramento. I didn't say that, but the Dalai Lama can't mean this literally. Right. right? <laughs> so I sit there for a minute and... um yeah, you know, and I just, you know, begin to tell him my ancestors and, and what have you. He leaves me, goes over to a uh, staffer in our office, grabs his hand, asks him the same thing. And when he's done, he comes back in front of me and he grabs my hand. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. This is live. It's quiet in the chamber. Right. And so we're just for f about 45 seconds or so just sitting there looking at each other in the eyes. And he drops my hand, he leaves. The moment he leaves, all the members run up and, oh my God, let me touch your hand, let me grab your hand, let me grab your hand, I'm playing a lottery tonight. You know, you're... <laughs> the coolest thing about the story is my daughter, um, at the time she was, uh, she may have been seven, seven or eight, and um, she uh, says, Dad, I saw you on TV today, and you were holding hands with um, you know, a guy, and, and she said in a robe, right? And I said, oh, I said, you know, so it perfect opportunity for me to teach her about the Dalai Lama, you know, right. what he represents. And um, so that was probably the coolest story. And he was probably the coolest person that uh, that I met. But, you know, the president of Ireland came in. Um, that was a pretty uh, surreal experience as well. He walks in after hours at the time. And I happened to be working on a project. Um, so I stayed after for about an hour or so. And he walks in. It was just him. And he is, you know, Secret Service and all folks. I mean, he was walking so fast, he left them. He walks up to me and says, um, introduces himself. You know, I introduce myself. And he says, hey, um, do you drink? <laughs> I said, um, you know, you're not really knowing where the question right. is sort of going. So I said, well... I said, yeah, well, you know, after work hours, I may occasionally, you know, um, and he says, well, if you ever come to Ireland, uh, look me up and pull, pull out a card, gave me his card, right. president of Ireland. If you ever come to Ireland, look me up and we'll, we'll grab a beer. First drinks on Right. Me. Nice. And I said, uh, in my mind, I'm like, well, I, I don't know that it would be that easy to uh, just call up a head of state right. <laughs> in another country to have a beer, but I appreciated the, the gesture. Um, so yeah, you know, we've, we've had folks come in. I mean, I, I don't get too, you know, starstruck. Um, 
How small was Kevin Hart? Was he really? Kevin Hart was <laughs> really, really short. Kevin Hart was really, really nice, yeah. though. I uh, had an opportunity to have, you know, about a five, ten minute conversation yeah. with him. Kendrick Lamar, when he came in. Um, Who was yeah. smaller, Kendrick Lamar or Kevin Hart? Oh, Kevin Hart, yeah. by, by far. Kevin Hart was was really, really short, uh, like I said. But, yeah, we, we've had Halle Berry's come in, Rosario Dawson. Um like I said, you know, we've had, you know, athletes come in um, and, you know, that they're more in awe of, you know, the room, right? right? The, the, the chamber. Um, you get any autographs on the daily file? Not no. on the daily file. No, no. Uh, I, I've gotten a few though. When, uh, you know, current governor, uh, when he was Lieutenant governor, he came in and, you know, I don't know. Maybe I had a hunch he was going to yeah. run for governor at some point. He signed a uh, uh, Jesse Jackson signed uh, something for me as well. Uh, Quincy Jones um, it was it was pretty cool meeting him as well. He uh, he had a, a um, <laughs> I don't know. He he was very because he was in a room. He was in the speakers um, the Willie Brown conference room. I remember going in. There was a ton of people there trying to meet him, and I went in to meet him, and he. He said, hey man, that's a really, really nice suit. <laughs> and uh, you know, we talked music for a few minutes. I play right. the drums, so we talked music for a little while, and and uh, that was cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. We we there's always someone. Kim Kardashian came in. Oh yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. She was she was nice, very very uh, uh, cordial. Came in and spoke to everyone. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on anyone else that was uh, you know, that I can remember. Um, but yeah, we've like I said, they come in and and oftentimes if it's not during session, they'll sort of went before half the capital was, you know, sort of shut down for repairs, they'd sneak in through the chamber to avoid going in the hall right. and running in the press. So we'd see them oftentimes when they'd walk through. Are you always on the floor? Is it your office like on the green carpet? I, I'm on the floor, I would say ninety percent of the time. We all have office spaces upstairs. The chief clerk's office uh is in the majority leader's old office on the uh, historic side. Yeah. Um but I, I would say ninety percent of the time I'm in the chamber. Um just because, you know, you get members that come in with guests right. all the time, um, you know, staff and and that come in. You want to be there, um, you know, that way you're a resource. And it's, it's you know, just something to be able to look at all day. It's almost like surreal for me. I don't walk in. I walk in, rather, every day, and it's still surreal yeah. for me to it's be. It's kind of like, a, like, I don't know. None of us can go there. You know, you get the balconies, you get all these <laughs> right. other spots. <laughs> right, right, like, wow. right. It's, yeah, it, it's, it's a mystery. No, yeah. right. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really... I, I, you know, I think surreal is is the only word I can use. I mean, you, you're in a place where, and the way I sort of put this in perspective when I speak to students, is every law going back to 1869, mm -hmm. right, That that's on our books in the state of California, fifth largest economy, 40 million people here. Every law since 1869 was debated on the floor of the Assembly and Senate, right? I mean, everything, right? And the reason I say 1869, so California became a state officially September 9th, 1850, but the capital moved around in the earlier right. parts of statehood. And so when it, you know, permanently came to Sacramento and, you know, the first time they opened the chambers for the legislature was 1869, you just think about it. You're like, wow, I'm a part of history, Every single day, yeah, not just you my can role. Feel it in there. It's like right. hollowed ground, right? You know? you know, it's like, and you look at historic. I do a lot of research, um, and you look at these pictures. You know, we were talking about my buddy Alex Vassar, um, master historian, and he. This guy has stories for days. We were there yesterday talking to him, and you look at these historic photos, and right. you look at just the history that has been made on this floor. Groundbreaking legislation, legislation that impacts people's lives every single day debated right here. And I get to be a part of this process. I get to have sort of a front row seat in this process, mm -hmm. right? My yeah. role as as reading clerk. And so oftentimes, you know, during session, if there's a say a law or uh, debate on a particular matter for, for an extended period of time, you'll see me just sort of looking around. And I'm I'm literally taking in just, you know, the richness of the room and just the history of the room. For me, I would have never imagined, you know, if somebody would have told me 25 years ago that, you know, I'd be the reading clerk for the California State Assembly, mm -hmm. um, I would not have believed them at all. Yeah, you're going to be Willie Brown. <laughs> right. <laughs> just dress like him. That's <laughs> it. Right. 
you know, so it, it, it sort of adds that element of appreciation right. for the institution um, and just, you know, just the opportunity to, to, to be there. Right. It, it is it is a dream come true. And Kevin Mullen said this in his farewell speech on the floor at Speaker Pro Tem. Uh, and Kevin Mullen, I just want to give him just a bigger shout out. He is just the most incredible mentor and friend, um, you know, that I've had in in the Capitol. Right. He's going to go to Congress and do great things. And I hope, I hope they allow him to 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 uh, to preside Sorry, over it. Right. Yeah, 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 no. right, 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 right. C-SPAN. Yeah. Right. He's just incredible. But he said something in his farewell speech. He said, you know, having the opportunity to have that job was, was a dream job for him. Right. And for me, I can say the same thing. Having the opportunity to serve as reading clerk, it's really been a dream come true. I yeah. mean, it's just, just incredible. So, you know, obviously you have extremely busy times. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, like um, end of session, mm -hmm. right? Like you mm -hmm. just had this grind. Not as bad as it used to be. No. You know, it used to be like <laughs> you had a budget and right. end of session. And oh, you'd yeah. be like up till three in the morning. Right, right. You know, two weeks in a row. Yeah. Um, and then you have these downtimes. Like, right. What do you do like right now? Like, what is your day to day when there's no session? Right. Well, I get to come and talk to Jared. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's that's the first <laughs> thing I get to do. Public, right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, no, I mean, there's always something, you know, for us to do. As you mentioned, you know, we have that's the cool thing about the Capitol and just the way the legislative ebb process. Flow, right. Yeah. The ebb and flow of, uh, you know, you know, when it's going to be busy, you know, when you can take vacation, mm -hmm. you know, when it's going to be, you know, not so busy. Right. And so right now we're always working to archive a lot of what's happened during the last session. So the 21, 22 session, we archive, you know, the bills and uh, we're looking at. Oh, you uh, got to get all the bills signed. Right. And, well, right. right. I mean that. And then, you know, our publications, uh, you know, our, our final publications to close out the session. Um, we're doing that. Other publications that we work on is sort of materials of resource, you know, resource materials for staff and, mm -hmm. and members. And then really it's prepping for the next session. That's crazy. So we'll start to have meetings, um, you know, regarding the organizational session and just how right. that's going to take place. I mean, there's so many uh, details that go into, you know, those sessions. Um, you yeah. know, so we'll start that probably in the next couple of weeks. But yeah, there's always something to do. We're working on historical research right. projects and uh, requests from members. Um, always something to do. Always, yeah. Just yeah. not as, you know, the, the the need to get it done like ASAP right now, like, you know, right. as you would do. In a floor session, isn't isn't there? But there's always always work to be done. It's interesting. I was I was just reading this uh, in the news the other day about an example, and when Pete Wilson was governor, mm -hmm. that his you know one of his staff was supposed to take a group of vetoed bills to the clerk right. so that they could <laughs> register it, and the guy got distracted and he missed the deadline, right. and yeah. because he missed the deadline. Uh -huh. Uh, all the bills he like left them on a copy or something like that. He, I, he didn't turn them the clerk yeah, or something. Right, like that. right, right. Yeah, so all those yeah. bills became law, right. even though yeah. they were supposed to be vetoed. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, are you guys getting like vetoed bills and signed bills? Like, yeah. So the we, we is sending them to you. Yeah. So we produce a what's called a a, a, veto, a, a veto daily file. So you'll have a daily file. I want to say it's available online right now. Um, that lists all the veto messages right. from the governor. We receive them from the governor's office. Uh, like I said, at that point, we receive signing messages and veto messages. The vetoes, again, go into the file. That's produced. That's public information. So if you right. ever want to go in and read the governor's veto message, not just the bill that was vetoed, you can do that in in the file, um, which, again, is available online or in hard yeah. copy. Um, those are cool. I, I'll read uh, uh, the veto messages um, occasionally. They can be entertaining um, sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think the... the uh, most notable example of that is the Tom Amiano Arnold Schwarzenegger oh, rift. Yeah. I don't Great. know if you recall that. No, I don't, yeah. But yeah. So I the short Army version of the story, yeah. right, is that uh, I want to say former assembly member Tom Amiano, great, great, I incredibly uh, funny guy. Right. Um, I guess he had went to an event. It may have been a Willie Brown and Arnold Schwarzenegger event, and uh, he had yelled out. We'll just say words I, I can't necessarily repeat mm -hmm. on air um, uh, toward Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so uh, Governor Schwarzenegger at the time vetoed one of uh, Tom Amiano's bills. And you can look this up online. Um, and he there was a, a sort of a hidden message in the veto that, again, I can't repeat uh, online. Um, I remember when that message came and it was all over, you know, all of the news. Right. And, um, when you read it, you know, it took me a, a few seconds to find, you know, the hidden message. And it was like, 
almost like if you take this word, this word, this word, that yeah. word, and sort of put it together. And, like, and oh, what do they call that an anagram? <laughs> right, <Yeah. laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, so yeah, the veto messages are definitely entertaining. Um, That's you know, funny. Sometimes. Do you, and, do you remember the last time where a bill became law because it wasn't signed? There have been several examples. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, I mean, you know, the governor, just to, you know, for listeners that may not understand this part of the other uh, process, once a bill reaches the governor, the governor has three options. He or she can sign the bill, um, veto the bill or do nothing. If they do nothing, 12 days it becomes law. Um, I, I know. I can't think of. Uh, I know in 15, 16, there were, there were several examples um, beyond that, I'm sure there may have been an example or two since then, uh, 15, 16, I know, um, governor Brown, Jerry Brown, when he was governor the first time, uh, he had a few that, uh, uh, that became law without his signature. And, and, you know, the question then becomes, well, why doesn't the governor sign right. a bill, right? Why would he or she just allow it to become law? Um, th- I mean, the, the answer to that would probably be you know, um, be many, many of different reasons. I would say political reasons, right? They're yeah, it's kind of like reasons. not voting, right? Right. Or right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, not voting. There was a quick story. It's pretty cool, actually, when there were talks about um, in the 70s uh, about tearing down the Capitol, current Capitol, uh, and building a new state of the art Capitol, mm-hmm. so to speak. Uh, that legislation actually passed both houses. I can't remember the bill number off the top of my head. It passed both houses and uh, Reagan at the time, I believe was governor, uh, didn't sign it, um, but it didn't become law. Oh, so it's weird. like, yeah, it's like this weird example of what passed both houses of right. the legislature, but didn't become law and it wasn't signed. And he didn't want to sign it for political reasons, right. right? I mean, he wasn't, from my understanding, in favor of tearing down the Capitol, building a new Capitol. Right. It didn't sign it, but again, didn't, didn't become law. So maybe there are... Uh, you know, ways to sort of uh, make a bill disappear <laughs> without the governor's signature. Yeah. But yeah, generally speaking, the governor does sign or you know veto the bill. And the legislature has the option to override the governor's veto, mm-hmm. which doesn't happen often. In fact, I think 1979 uh, was the last time that happened. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure there are probably discussions um, about it, but right. yeah, it hasn't uh, officially happened since 1979. Yeah, and in fact, Jerry Brown uh, was the governor, you know, during that time. And, and I want to say he had four bills uh, that the legislature overrode uh, his veto on during a span of like from 1977, to like 1979, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, not mistaken, but it doesn't happen often, yeah. but, but there is an option. So you've mentioned a few times mm-hmm. that, you know, Fashion and looking good is important. To you. <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, where 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 do you get your suits around town? Uh, you know what, um, Macy's. I mean, it it really just depends. I've had, uh, I would say, dressing the part is is uh is yeah maybe twenty percent of the job. Yeah, right? you, you um, mentioned Willie. Uh, you know, Rod right. Wright was always Rod really Wright into was his always suits. shop. Yeah, yeah. His you know, going hall was always any good yeah. fashion advice. Are you getting any bad habits? Are you, you, you know having to take a second mortgage because Rod Wright needs <laughs> to buy Brioni suits? No. Um, so you know, I, I don't. Uh, I, I try to. You know, my wife and and, and kids. I try to. You know, keep a budget. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I will treat myself to a suit, maybe two, maybe three, once yeah. every couple of months. But uh, no, Rod Wright, as you mentioned, John Perez was actually, I mean, he was always just, just sharp and on point. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, you know, Macy's, uh, Norsem Rack always has some pretty good, uh, pretty good deals. Um, you know, my wife, she, she will, you know, find something every now and again. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I just try to, you know, look the See, part. Yeah. And you can set. look good guys without spending a fortune. You know, <laughs> yes, you can. Go, take, yes, go, yeah, go right, talk to yeah. David out there. Right, right, Staffers. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like I said, I appreciate it. it. And it's also an opportunity to, uh, you know, try and set an example, you know, for newer staffers coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously. Especially with this whole like COVID thing. Everybody's yeah. wearing like jeans and tennis shoes yeah, every day. Yeah, yeah. I just, I've always learned um, that, uh, or understood rather, that people are always, you know, watching, mm-hmm. right? And, um, you know, being in the Capitol, being in sort of the, uh, the fishbowl, the fishbowl is really uh, what we call the chamber because we're, you know, just right. down below. And when tours come in, people come in, 
Um, they kind of, you know, surround you. And that's another difficult component of the job is like trying to tune out what's going on when the tour guides are coming in. And sometimes you got four tours going on. The kids are talking, the tour yeah. guides. Uh, but people are always watching, you know. And, and my mother used to uh, always say when I grew up, people are going to talk about you regardless. Give them something good to talk about. Yeah. So, you know, if you're dressing and looking nice and looking good. And, and then you also, you know, you dress good, you feel good. Mm-hmm. At least for me, when I leave the house, I feel a a sense of uh, uh, accomplishment, right? right? Just just knowing that I get to work and the job, or I get to dress like Speaker Brown, and I get to work in the White House. You yeah. Know? Which so everything sort of came full circle, uh, you know, for me. And uh, like I said, it, it it's just truly been been a phenomenal uh, ride thus far, and I, you know, hope to. <laughs> continue that ride for as long as I can. No, definitely. Well, yeah. you got a lot of work coming up. Well, you got 20 some new members to learn yeah, their yeah, names yeah, and uh, yeah. prepare for next right. session. Yeah. And, you know, uh, as I mentioned, my, my good friend, uh, Speaker Pro Tim Mullen is leaving. So we'll have a new uh, Speaker Pro Tim. Um, you know, Chris Ward, has, you know, stepped into that role and, and does an incredible mm-hmm. job. As I mentioned, assembly member Mia Bonta, she, you know, stepped in for a while. So it'll be interesting to see who. Yeah. Is in that role full time. Um, you know, part of, uh, you know, I may have mentioned this earlier, but part of that role for me is like the relationship that the reading clerk and the presiding officer right. has. And I was fortunate, like I said, for a number of years to be able to share the stage. You know, I, I would always say Kevin was the, uh, you know, he's the quarterback. I'm the center, right? Yeah. So I'm hiking it and he's That's sort of funny. directing. And, those voices just stick in your head. <laughs> All those memories were desirable. Right, right, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. So, you know, maybe him and I will work on a, a book or, you know, uh, uh, something, but yeah, no, we got, we got a lot of work coming up, uh, ahead in the, uh, in the new session. I, I I'm excited for it. Every, every session brings a new opportunity, you know, you know like I said, to learn, uh, not just the names of members, but to really, uh, you know, build rapport and relationships mm-hmm. with the members and, and the good work they're doing on behalf of the 40 million people in this state. Um, you know, you, as mentioned, you, I get to be a part of that process. And so I, I get excited, you know, the, the organizational is going to be a busy day. That's, you know, I told, told my wife, you know, don't wait up. Uh, it's going to be a intense day just because, you know, members are, are being sworn in. They're bringing their families. Everyone's right. excited. It's a big deal for some that, that you know, maybe never held public office. Um, you know, it, it is a big deal, no, yeah, um, no. you know, and so you just try to prepare for it and do the best you can and, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, support the needs of the members with respect to, you know, how to move their ideas through the course of the legislative process, which no. is it's phenomenal. I, mean, yeah. I get a rush. It's, it's, it's great. That's cool. That's yeah. cool watching you talk about it too. Yeah, yeah. no, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David, for joining us. Learned yeah. a lot, man. I talked to you forever, but <laughs> right. uh, yeah. I understand you got to go. You got stuff to do. And yeah, so, you know, work to do. Uh, like I said, but I you know definitely appreciate the opportunity to come. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, and know. guys, you know, Please approach David, you know, yeah. there is a smile <laughs> right. under there. Right. Don't be afraid. I, let me just, if I may, I, I you know, I, I have to, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not upset all the time. I'm not evil. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I just during session, you, right. can, you know, I'm, I'm, I try to be focused, right. but, but all in all, um, you know, I just want to, right. <laughs> I do want to say that, you know, mentorship is something that's, that's important for me. And part of the, the responsibility for me and other, you know, folks yeah. um, in the building is to try and help. Uh, create uh, opportunities for others to be a resource to others. Right. Uh, so for listeners out there, staff, uh, you know, doesn't matter who you are, where you are. Uh, if I can be a resource yeah. and, and someone that you can call and, and, and rely on for information, like I said, I'm always available. And I think that's again, the bigger part of, of the job and the opportunity. Right. It's not just learning, you know, uh, the constitution and, and, and the rules and government codes and all this stuff and keeping it to myself. It's like, I want to see folks, succeed and do the best they can um, at what they're doing and yeah. serving, you know, your member or, you know, a committee, um, you know, we are, you know, Chief Clerk's Office is a resource and, and, and you know, we want to be used as such. So I yeah. just wanted to throw that out there. But well, yeah. well put. You know, <laughs> it is like, it, it's like a family. Like sure. Florida is a of family. Course. Right, it's, right. It's, a, yeah. it's cool. It's, yeah. it's good to see you guys yeah. work together yes, and indeed. help other folks out. For so. sure. For sure. Awesome. Well put, David. Yes. All right. Cool, man. Thanks, man. Thanks so Good much. Talking. All right. <laughs>